We've already begun looking at the Gospel of Matthew, and we have identified the central theme as the Messiah, that the Messiah has come. Matthew starts out his Gospel identifying Jesus Christ as the son of David and the son of Abraham. Within this theme are a number of uh, uh, sub-themes that we began identifying in the last lesson. These include that Jesus comes from God, that he is a savior, that he has absolute authority, he serves people in, in particular ways, and that he makes disciples. We're going to look at the passages that develop, at a number of passages that develop these themes in this lesson. First of all, the theme that Jesus is from God. One way that Matthew presents that Jesus is from God is by teaching that Jesus fulfills prophecy. More than any other uh, uh, gospel, the gospel of Matthew emphasizes the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and how Jesus is the one who fulfills uh, the prophecies made uh, uh, for the nation of Israel and for Israel's mission to the rest of the world. The first example is in the birth of Christ, the virgin birth. Uh, you will remember well the teaching that uh, the Lord speaks to Joseph, who is engaged to Mary, to reassure him that her unexpected pregnancy is from God, uh, that this is a miracle and the conception is from the Holy Spirit. In establishing this as the identity of Jesus as the Messiah, Matthew quotes from Isaiah. As we go through these uh, references to Old Testament quotes to uh, prophecies that are fulfilled in Jesus, you'll see them standing out in bold on the slides. The quote from Isaiah is, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah originally was teaching that in the amount of time that it takes for a woman to conceive and have a child within a matter of, of months, uh, we would say, of course, nine months, that the people of Israel could expect delivery from the oppression that they were experiencing at the time, from the oppression that uh, Isaiah was describing that they would suffer. This is said to be fulfilled in Jesus. That is, it had a meaning uh, for its time, but its fullest meaning is seen in the special birth of Jesus. The reference in the time of Isaiah referred to uh, the time it would take for a young woman to have a child. And there is a difference between the Hebrew word for young woman and the Greek word for virgin. Uh, the Old Testament uses the Hebrew generic word for a young woman of childbearing age. And the New Testament uses the Greek word for virgin, which means what we mean in English, uh, a woman who's not been intimate with a man. So the first prophecy of Jesus that is fulfilled is that he is born of a virgin. And this takes a new fulfilled meaning in the gospel. Also, the birth of Jesus is presented as the fulfillment of another passage. Uh, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Bethlehem, a small town, is said to be important because of a ruler who will come from there. The ruler, uh, first to come from Bethlehem was King David. But the promise to David was made that an ultimate ruler would come uh, whose rule would never end. That didn't happen with his uh, descendants in the time of the Old Testament, but we are told that it is being fulfilled in the time of Jesus, that the one who will uh, be uh, the most prominent leader and the one whose kingdom will never end is now born in Bethlehem, and that is Jesus. The protection of this ultimate Messiah is when 
Herod is about to have uh, the children, the age of the newborn king, uh, massacred in Bethlehem. Joseph is to take his family to Egypt to escape Herod. And then when it is safe for him to come back, we're told that it fulfills what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And Joseph is told that it's now safe to take uh, to take Jesus back to their uh, native land. Again, fulfillment means something had happened before and then it is brought to a fuller meaning in Jesus. Just as the Israelites had been in Egypt and were rescued and brought back, the prophets would use that imagery to say when the Israelites are taken into captivity, uh, Assyria, Babylon, that they will be like, they will be restored like they were in the time that they had been in bondage in Egypt. Out of Egypt I called my son, but this is fulfilled specifically in the uh, protection of Jesus as a boy in Egypt and the return of Jesus as a boy once it was safe for him again in, uh, in Judea and more particularly in Galilee. So he fulfills this prophecy. While he is being protected in Egypt, what he is escaping is the terrible uh, massacre that Herod ordered, something that seems to be uh, in line with uh, outside the Bible histories of, of Herod who killed people right and left to maintain his power. Uh, Herod, when he learns from the wise men that a new king of the Jews has been born, he sends and kills all the male children in Bethlehem uh, and the region who were two years old or younger. And we're told that this fulfills an Old Testament prophecy. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel in the Old Testament had uh, wept over not having children when she finally had children uh, she died in childbirth with the second one, and then her children were taken captive. And so the prophetic language is that when God's people are captive, that uh, figuratively Rachel is weeping for her children until they are delivered. But this is said to be fulfilled in the terrible treatment of the male children of Bethlehem by Herod, that this is a, a terrible uh cause for reaping and lamentation, uh, an allusion to how wicked uh, human kings can be, in particular uh, King Herod. And the context is that this is fulfilled because in the meantime, God is protecting the ultimate king, the boy Jesus, who's now safe in Egypt. By the time Jesus is grown, it is John the Baptist who is uh, preparing the way. And we are reminded that the prophet Isaiah had said that uh, the Lord's ultimate deliverer would uh, would be coming and, and people need to get ready and, 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 and clear the roads for him to come in. And this prophecy is said to be fulfilled when John the Baptist announces the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is, God's king is about to take his place as ruler. Of course, the context is that John the Baptist is talking about the arrival of Jesus as the Messiah. And so John the Baptist is described as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So the context, again, is that Jesus is the coming king and as had been said so long ago, now the ultimate fulfillment is that uh, the Lord is coming. He's going to do something great. And uh, as John says, this is the kingdom of heaven at hand. He's saying that God's true ruler is about to arrive. After his baptism, Jesus settles not in his boyhood home of Nazareth, but in uh, Capernaum. 
uh, a town on the side of the on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. That is up where some of the smaller tribes of of the nation of Israel had been when they had divided up their territory in Old Testament times. And so Jesus is described as the Messiah who comes from a uh, modest uh, background, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has shined. It is then Jesus who is preaching the message that we read that John was pre presenting, uh, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and Jesus then begins calling to people to repent because the rule of God is about to be established. The identity of Jesus is specified to be the humble beginnings from a lakeside town up in Galilee. Galilee, a land where a lot of non-Jewish uh, people are, uh, a place representative of people who are in spiritual darkness, and now a place from which light will shine in the work of Jesus. So Jesus, once he settles in Capernaum, is fulfilling this Old Testament prophecy. Um, although it doesn't stand out bolded, you'll see the um, Old Testament prophecy set off as verse uh, beginning in verse 18. When Jesus goes around and it becomes well known, until the time comes for his ultimate, uh, his ultimate sacrifice in Jerusalem, he's careful to not draw undue attention to himself. Uh, he's very careful with his timing. And so when the crowds are getting too big and so much that Pharisees want to get rid of Jesus, he withdraws. Now, plenty of people follow him. He does miracles, but he doesn't want the word spread yet. And we're told that this is a fulfillment of an Isaiah prophecy. The prophecy is, behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. Until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. You can see the connection in the withdrawal of Jesus, the uh, avoiding of uh, controversial fame when he uh, withdraws from that, um, that publicity, uh, where he is uh, the gentle uh, deliverer, servant, whom Isaiah had prophesied. And again, we see the theme that in withdrawing from the central focus of Jewish leaders is extending God's hope beyond the Jewish people to the Gentiles. When we read that uh, Jesus teaches in parables, we hear him explain that he does it because he is fulfilling what Isaiah said. And he says that the people who won't listen to his message are the kind of people that Isaiah described and his teaching in parables is a response to what Isaiah prophesied. It was the way that way in Isaiah's day and it's that way in the day of Jesus. The stubborn people who just won't learn the lessons are described this way by Isaiah. You will indeed hear but never understand and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears, they can barely hear. And with their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. And then he goes on to say that uh, people like the disciples are listening, 
And then we're told farther down, in beginning in verse 34, all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was said by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Jesus is presented as the ultimate fulfillment of the kind of spokesman that God sends to reach those who will hear, even though they're those who refuse to hear. Jesus calls upon the people to worship in a way that honors the true word of God. And he says that Isaiah had prophesied of people like the people in in his uh, culture and day. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus is continuing the message that came from the Old Testament prophets, and he is fulfilling it by telling them that he has, he preserves the commands of the Lord. He calls on people to worship as as God wants them to and not to follow their human traditions. When Jesus enters Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry. It is a humble kingly triumph. You know, he comes in on a donkey and we're told that this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So they do that and the people praise him. Notice in verse nine, as the son of of David, praise Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. I say that it is humble, kingly triumph because it is remarkably like the way that Solomon became king when a brother had tried to seize the throne before him. Solomon makes his appearance arriving on a donkey, not a war horse. And this is a reflection of of Solomon's taking power, that Jesus comes in humbly on a donkey. And the prophets had said that that is the way that God's ruler would ultimately come. Jesus uses prophecies to challenge the entrenched religious establishment. When the chief priests object that children in the temple are crying out Hosanna to the son of David when Jesus is there, Jesus says to them, haven't you read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise? Farther on in uh, the chapter, the established leaders in the temple don't like what Jesus is doing, standing around teaching in the temple. And he says, uh, and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority? That is, who said you could do this? And he goes beyond their petty concept of who is in control of the temple in their day. And he reminds them that the people that they should listen to are the kind of people that the establishment would reject. And he quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And he goes on to say that because of their stubbornness, God's kingdom, the rule of God, will no longer be exclusive to that entrenched establishment, to the Jewish establishment. That will be falling apart and God will extend his kingdom to others. As the Pharisees begin to try to trap Jesus in questions, he throws out an Old Testament passage to them that refers to the Messiah, and he challenges their 
earthbound concept of who the Christ is. He quotes from a Psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then he challenges the Pharisees who are challenging him. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? They can't ask, answer and they back off. But the point of Jesus is that the true Christ, the true Messiah, the true descendant of David is a son of David, but one that David refers to as Lord. We've looked at prophecies that Matthew emphasizes to show that Jesus is the son of God or that he is from God. He is the promised Messiah. But in several direct ways, Matthew shows God directly revealing that Jesus is his son. In the birth account, we're told, as we've already noticed, that Joseph is informed that Mary is with child from the Holy Spirit and that what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That is that Jesus is born from God, and uh, an elusive, an illusion in, in, in pointing to the concept that is developed that he is the son of God. When we uh, read before of the protection of Jesus in Egypt and his uh, ultimate return from Egypt, Jesus is described when Matthew quotes from out, uh, from the Old Testament, out of Egypt, I called my son. And so he is referring to Jesus, even the young Jesus, as God's son. More directly, at the baptism of Jesus, God speaks audibly and says, this is my son. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. When Peter makes his confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds by saying he didn't learn that from people, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. So in Peter's case, it is God who is revealing that Jesus is the Son of the living God, the Christ. At the transfiguration, when Peter wants to build three tabernacles, God speaks again uh, to single out Jesus. And he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So God actually says that Jesus is his son in the Gospel of Matthew. The prophecies show that Jesus comes from God as the Messiah. Moving on to another thing. Jesus is the Savior, both for Israel and for people in the world who are not Israel. As we said, he is the Christ, the Messiah, who is going to rule over Israel. We trace his genealogy, son of David, son of Abraham. Jesus is called the Christ. The idea of the Christ, the Messiah, is that he will be the ultimate deliverer and ruler of God's people. And so he is shown to be through the genealogy, uh, the ultimate product of God's people to be their ruler, so that in the second chapter of Matthew, in the description of Jesus coming from Bethlehem, we're told that a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel is the one born in Bethlehem, and it's a direct application to Jesus to become the ruler of God's people. There is a time when Jesus is reaching out first only to the people of Israel. They have served God's purpose to bring his message to all people. And when he first sends out the 12, he tells them not to go to the non-Jews, 
but rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there is a time when a person who is not an Israelite, who's not a Jew, asks for a miracle. And Jesus says, I will send only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. However, we'll return to that instance where he does reach out beyond Israel uh, because of the woman's persistent faith. There is an emphasis on the involvement of Jesus with people who aren't Jewish from the very early days of, of his life on earth. The wise men who come from the East are not Jewish, and they come to acknowledge the newborn king of the Jews. When God protects young Jesus from Herod, he sends him to the non-Jewish land of Egypt. Later, when Jesus encounters a Gentile that is non-Jewish centurion, he says that his faith is greater than he has found in all Israel. And that woman who asked for a miracle and first was told that Jesus had come only to the lost sheep of Israel was in Tyre and Sidon, a non-Jewish section. She was a Canaanite, a non-Jew. And after she persists in begging for Jesus to heal his da her daughter, Jesus tells her, great is your faith, and the child is instantly healed. Also in reaching non-Jewish people, Jesus, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, is telling the apostles to make disciples from all nations. Another theme in Matthew is that Jesus claims divine authority. The Gospel of Matthew concludes with Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. One way in which Matthew emphasizes the authority of Jesus on earth and in heaven is the way people react to his preaching. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew records, he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. In a different way, when Jesus does a miracle and people uh, he are objecting, uh, before he does the miracle, people are objecting that he has said to someone that his sins are forgiven. And then he tells the person who can't walk to walk. And he says he does that so that they can see that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. When Jesus is taken at the end and interrogated by the high priest, the high priest demands that Jesus say whether or not he claims to be the Christ, the Son of God, to which Jesus replies, you have said so. And then he goes on to expand that and apply to himself from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He claims power from heaven that they will ultimately see in the days to come. In his teachings, Jesus claims authority over eternity, over people's eternal state. <clears throat> in uh, the seventh chapter, of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about people who will claim to be his followers and call him Lord, Lord. And then he declares, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you. That is then on judgment day. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. In one of his parables, in Matthew chapter 13, he says what he's teaching is that the Son of Man, his name for himself, will send his angels and they'll gather out of the kingdom all causes of sin, all lawbreakers, throw them into the fiery furnace where they'll be punished. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He's talking about eternal judgment and he is the one who will condemn and reward. When he gives a prophecy of, of, of signs of the end, he says that the Son of Man will be seen coming on the clouds of heaven with power, that ultimately he will be the one who comes with power. He expands on that theme, his uh, 
authority over eternity in the 25th chapter of Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, he's going to sit on his glorious throne and he will say to those who have been faithful, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he'll say to those who have not been faithful, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So Jesus claims that he will be the one who has authority on judgment day to say who will inherit the kingdom and who will be eternally punished. Another theme of the Gospel of Matthew is identifying what the ministry of Jesus was while he was on earth. And it is summarized as teaching, preaching, and healing. A summary statement is in the fourth chapter of Matthew. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Throughout Matthew, you see him as a teacher and preacher. As a matter of fact, various forms of the word teach occur in Matthew 25 times. Without reading every verse, we're told in at least a couple of passages that he teaches in synagogues. He claims in the Sermon on the Mount that he is teaching the fulfillment of the law of Moses, not the abolishment of the law of Moses. As we read before, but it's mentioned more than once when he teaches, he teaches crowds by teaching with authority. On a number of occasions, and you see them listed there, Matthew shows people addressing him with the title teacher. In his teaching, he condemns people who set aside the word of God to keep their human traditions. So he's a teacher of the word of God. And we're told in a couple of places that are mentioned there that when he teaches in the temple, he frustrates the entrenched establishment uh, there at the temple. Over and over, Jesus is referred to as a teacher and similarly as a preacher. His preaching message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is summarized as proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Generically, it's said in the 11th chapter that he preaches in cities throughout Galilee, that he speaks to crowds, that he preaches good news to the poor, that he is fulfilling the prophecy of proclaiming justice to the Gentiles. We're told that he speaks to the people in parables. Thirdly, Jesus is presented in Matthew as a healer. He heals all kinds of disease and affliction. In particular, uh, casting out demons, healing seizures, healing paralyzed people. He's able to heal disease even when the diseased person is not in the same place he is. He uh, heals a fever. He raises someone from death. He heals a hemorrhaging woman. He heals blindness and muteness that demons cause. Also, lameness, uh, uh, crippled people, people who cannot speak. He heals all kinds of disease and affliction. A great theme in Matthew is that Jesus makes disciples. There are two passages that stand out regarding this making disciples theme. One is that he promises to build his church, and the other that he commissions his followers to make disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, the Lord calls on his apostles to answer, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Then he adds, and I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he introduces the idea of building his church when Peter makes his great confession. The other strong emphasis on making disciples is the conclusion of the Gospel of Matthew. 
And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's look a little more closely at these two expressions of the theme. When he promises to build the church, he is using a word that is rarely used in the Gospels. Only Matthew of the four writers uses the word church in chapter 16, 18, which we just noticed, and also in 18, 17. The Gospels do use other terms to describe the people of God. So perhaps we need to notice what church means. Generically, the word means a group that is called together. In uh, the book of Acts and in the epistles, church is used much more often and much more specifically about the group that is called together <coughs> around Jesus. As we just noticed, <coughs> the Lord promises to build his church on what Peter has confessed. He uh, he has Peter saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. What he is promising to do is to create a called together group, his church. And that called together group is called together on the foundation of the identity of Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. The passage in Matthew 18 assumes that his followers will be together in such a group, and it deals with the topic of church discipline. The other expansion of this theme is what we call the Great Commission. He is appointing disciples to carry on his work after he returns to heaven. All four Gospels define this work, uh, presenting Jesus giving that commission on different occasions with different emphases. The emphasis in Matthew 28 is on making disciples. This is going to happen as believers are going throughout the world, sometimes expressed as preaching the gospel, but here the emphasis is on bringing the untaught to the point that they become followers. That is what it is, what it is to make disciples. And we're told that this involves baptism and continued teaching of what Jesus taught. And Jesus promises to be with his people in this work. The theme is further developed in other New Testament books. The other Gospels present additional expressions of this commission. Acts and the epistles expand on the meaning and connect disciple-making to both salvation and church membership. So there you have it, the themes around which you can gather the material in the book of Matthew to help you understand where in the message of Matthew a particular passage fits. Our next lessons uh, will have to do with uh, Mark and Luke. Uh, we hope to have that up for you uh, and complete and for you to complete it by May the 26th. Remember that you have an exam on Unit 1, uh, May 27th or 28th, and that will cover up through all we covered on the book of Matthew with a short lesson on Mark and Luke as well.